Thank you so much for allowing us once again to enter your lives, enter your home or wherever you're watching this video to share something we trust will be a blessing and uplift your heart. We're living in a day and age when we look around and you might say, how in the world can my heart be lifted? Well, we plan on doing that today by giving you much of the Word of God. And Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. We're going to make that very relevant to you today. But I am very excited to be living today, and we all should be, because never in the annals of world history have we ever witnessed such a proliferation of the signs that Jesus gave to us, saying, when you see all these things happening, then my coming is right at the door. And of course, those things are simultaneous right now. He didn't say when you see one or two or three of them happening, but when you see all these things simultaneously happening, I'm right at the door. My hand is on the door, ready to be opened and ready to come to earth again. Wars, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, and cultic activity. The Lord mentioned all of those things. And now you don't have to open the Bible to know about them. All you have to do is read the newspaper or turn on the TV and you hear about it. It's all around us simultaneously happening as Jesus said. Now, it points to something that's uh, quite relevant today. You know, the scientists that control the doomsday clock. Have you ever heard about that? Their hand is up there right now and they're getting closer and closer to midnight. They say this is the doomsday clock and it's almost on midnight and that will be the end of the world. Now, today we're saying it's not going to be, it is close to midnight, but it's not going to be the end of the world. Jack, I'm so glad that we can do this video for our friends and for everyone in general. Well, we're excellent. And by the way, we're calling it 1159, The Countdown. We do not believe the world is ever going to end. And for years, God has been enlightening my mind with verses from all over the Word of God that I'm going to put together today for you. You see, journalists have written up Van Ippie saying, he just said the world's going to end in a few years simply because I said Christ is going to return. That is the biggest error that's ever been proclaimed in Christian circles and huge denominations today are preaching that erroneous doctrine. And they call it ah millennialism, that there'll be no thousand year reign of Christ. Well, we cannot believe that the world will end for at least a thousand years because we are pre millennialists, believing that Jesus will come and start the thousand year reign on earth according to Revelation 20, verse 4. So the world can't end for at least another thousand years. However, I decided I was going to do something unusual. I took all the terms, all the texts, looked them all up, spent hours of research on each one of them, starting with the last day, the last days, the latter days, the latter time, the latter times, the latter years, the end of the world, the end, the time of the end, and everything imaginable on this subject. And we'll prove today that not one of them talks about the end of the world. The world's not going in. Even Armageddon is the, isn't the end of the world, Revelation 16, 16. For Armageddon is Christ coming back to put a stop to those who are slaughtering one another in warfare. Where's that? In Revelation chapter 11, verse 18. And Rexella, let's get into it. All right, Jake, some of those terms sound a little ominous, don't they? End of the world, end of the age, and all that. We're going to, I'm going to put him on the spot a little bit later here in this video, but will the world ever end, Jack? Not if one believes God's holy word. Ecclesiastes 1, 4, the earth abides forever. Psalm 104, verse 5, Yahweh God laid the foundation of the world, the earth, and it shall never, never be removed never be destroyed. Again, Jesus said, the meek shall inherit the earth. 
And that's Matthew 5, 5. But Psalm 37, 29 says, The righteous, including the meek, shall inherit the earth forever and forever. And forever means forever. And that's why Isaiah 45, 17 and Ephesians 3, 21 both say that it's a world without end. Amen, amen. And you know, Rexella, in all of our churches, we sing the Gloria Patre in our Sunday services. Glory be to God the Father, to God the Son, and to God the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, so is and now shall be. World without end. Amen. Amen. And the problem is they're preaching the end of the world and singing that it will never end. That's a contradiction. We're going to prove that the song is right and so is God's holy word. And some of you denominational preachers have it all wrong. And I pray that God will use this video to straighten you up spiritually and biblically. That's right. Most of the Protestant churches and Catholic churches sing yeah. that beautiful, sure. beautiful anthem at the beginning of their service, World yeah. Without End. And Amen. I've had priests Amen. write me saying, you know, we never thought about it. <laughs> We're taking St. Augustine's teaching about the end of the world and singing World Without End. Mm -hmm. We're going to correct this thing. Well, many accept the fact that Jesus is coming again. He's going to rule for 1,000 years, but they just don't believe that he's going to rule forever and forever. Can you prove that to us, Jack? Again, we all pray this prayer in our churches, Matthew 6, 9, which Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. That's not heaven. That's on earth. Now, what's going to happen and when? In Revelation 19, verse 11, we see Christ coming regally, royally, majestically on that white horse. And the armies in heaven follow him. We'll explain that later. And he comes at that moment as the King of the kings and Lord of the lords, verse 16, to rule and reign for 1,000 years, Revelation 20, verse 4. Now, the Bible says if we suffer with him, we're going to reign with him. For how long? First of all, we reign with him for the 1,000 years, but Christ is recommissioned after the 1,000 years, 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 28. And then his kingdom goes on forever and forever. Where is that? Well, you can find that in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. I also said we rule and reign with him for a thousand years, Revelation 20, verse 4. But after the recommissioning of Christ, we rule with him forever and forever after the thousand years, Revelation 22, 5. So it's a great thing to know that because he's going to be here on earth ruling forever and forever, the world can never blow up, disintegrate, dissolve. Uh, we're going to be around here for a long time. I just jotted down here. He said, Revelation 11, uh, Revelation 22, quoting from the book Revelation. Put him on the spot here, friends. If you take the book of Revelation out of the Bible, can you still prove to us that the world will not end throughout the rest oh, of the Bible? Throughout the entire Word of God. Let me give you a couple of examples. In Isaiah 7, verse 14, it talks about the virgin birth. That's the Old Testament predicting what should come, and that his name would be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted means God with us, Matthew 1, 23. And I quoted Isaiah 7, 14 about this virgin because it ties right in with Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. Unto us a child is born, virgin birth. Unto us a son is given. That's when he returns as Mashiach, Messiah, mm -hmm. our Christ. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. He didn't have any government the first time. This is when he comes the second time. And of his government and peace, there shall be no end. <laughs> I guess that speaks well. Daniel stands before King Nebuchadnezzar in the second chapter of that book. And he explains to him all the world powers that are coming. And they've all happened, as we'll see later in this study. But when he gets to verse 44, he says, In the days of these kings, the revived Roman Empire, the European Union, shall the God of heaven set up his kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. It shall stand forever. In Daniel 4, 3, he says, Messiah's kingdom shall be forever. In Daniel 4, 31, he says, His dominion and reign shall be an everlasting dominion and reign here on terra firma, on earth. 
That's why in 1 Timothy 1, 17, he is called the everlasting king. And that's why his father, Yahweh, says to him in Hebrews 1, 8, Thy throne, O God, is forever and forever. This is the father speaking to his own son and calls him God. Some of you called us better get right in your theology and call him God. And he reigns forever and ever. Now, the Virgin Mary did not misunderstand Gabriel's message on that great and glorious morning when he said to her in Luke 1, verses 32 and 33, Your son shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest, and he shall sit upon the throne of his father David in Jerusalem, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob, over the house of Israel, forever and forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Can't do any better than that. That's the Word of God. Oh, Jack, that's, yeah. that's really exciting, isn't it? Well, you uh, pick up the newspapers all the time and you see where governments have broken their promises to their people, where presidents have promised things and it didn't happen, where mothers and dads have promised things and it didn't happen, but there's one who will never break a promise and that is God, right? And Jack, you just said that He promised Israel the land forever. So right. that's a promise that right. he'll not break, right? People don't understand how much Yahweh God loves his people Israel. In Deuteronomy 7 verses 7 and 8, he tells them, you weren't the greatest of people. You weren't the largest in number. You were the fewest. But I loved you. And that's why God chose them to be his particular people. And they are called the elect. There are two elect groups, the church in 1 Peter 1, 2 and Titus 1, 1. But then there is the elect Israelites. And you can find that in Isaiah 42, 1, 45, 4, chapter 65, verses 9 and 22. Mine elect, mine elect. You find it also in Romans eleven twenty eight 28, about the Jew. Not that the Christian is being put down. We find that Yahweh has chosen Israel to be his wife, Jeremiah 3, 14, but we Christians are the bride of Christ, Revelation 19, 7. And so God has equalized it, but there's a great love for Israel. They are the apple of his eye, Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8. Now, I wrote a book, Rexella, mm -hmm. Millennium, Beginning or End, and I prove that God who cannot lie, Titus 1, verse 2, made promises to Israel, to his beloved people, 120 times that the earth would be theirs forever and forever. And should the world blow up in a catastrophe and end, then God would have lied to his people. And he's God. He doesn't exaggerate, prevaricate, or lie. Let me give you some tremendous verses here. Genesis 17, 8, I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land for an everlasting possession. Deuteronomy 440, the earth which the Lord thy God giveth thee is forever. Joshua 14, 9, Moses said, the land wherein thy feet hath trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever. Doesn't God mean what he says? First Chronicles 23, 25, David said, the Lord God of Israel hath given rest unto his people that they may dwell in Jerusalem, not heaven, Jerusalem, forever. Jeremiah 22, 5, Israel is the land the Lord hath given unto you and to your fathers forever and forever. Now, is our Lord going to rule over them forever and forever in the land that never ends? First Kings 2, 45. The throne of David shall be established forever on earth. Luke 1, 32 and 33. Psalm 145, 13. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Daniel 4, 3. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Daniel 4, 34. His dominion is an everlasting dominion on earth. And I quoted those two earlier. Daniel 7, 18, the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and forever and even forever and ever. Now, what are you going to do with those verses? You're going to do what I did and what you have to do. 
believing that the world will never end or God has been a prevaricator to his people, Israel. Oh, those are not all from the book of Revelation. He went all over the Bible just now proving to us that the world won't end and that Israel will dwell in that area of the world forever and forever. Well, we're just going to give you a little foundation right here. Two R's, the rapture, the revelation, and if you watch our weekly program, you already know uh, the section of the video that we're doing right now. The rapture, what is the rapture? The revelation, what is the revelation? Uh, Jack, explain the two R's, will you please? That has to do with the return of the Lord. First of all, there's much confusion today in Christian circles because Christians believe that the rapture is the second coming of Christ. It isn't. The revelation when he comes seven years later with his saints is the second coming because he comes to earth the second time like he did the first time. The rapture is just an intermediary event to snatch us into his presence so that we can be married to him at the great marriage of the Lamb and return with him as his bride to Jerusalem to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. But I love the rapture. And this happens seven years before the millennium begins. And that's described in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 18. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. Now watch this. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, with the dead in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord, wherefore, frighten one another with these words. No, no, no. <laughs> comfort. <laughs> it's a blessed hope, Titus 2.13. So comfort one another with the fact that Jesus is coming. It's again described in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, all be dead, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. We shall be changed? What does that mean? When we die, the body goes into the ground, but the spirit goes to be with the Lord. As the body without the spirit is dead, James 2.26. And over on the other side, they don't need bodies because everything in the third heaven of 2 Corinthians 12 to presently is in spirit form except the Lord Jesus Christ in His glorified body. And I'm not sure about Eden and Elias who are taken without dying if they're in just normal bodies. But otherwise, it's all spirit world, including the angels who are ministering spirits, Hebrews 1.14. What's the purpose then of coming back to earth to get their bodies? Because they're coming back to rule and reign with Christ and there are going to be at least three billion people left after the tribulation catastrophes occur and they, the living, cannot see spirit bodies or spirit entities. So they come to get their bodies so everyone can see them as they rule and reign with Christ. And so they're called up in the twinkling of an eye and they're changed as they go up to get the new glorified body, the exact one Christ had. And if you study Acts 1, 9, 10, uh, Christ had a body that could be touched, could be uh, seen, could partake of food, and that's going to be like our new body. Okay, that's why... David could say, I'll be satisfied when I awaken with thy likeness, Psalm 17, 15. And Philippians 3, 21 says, Who shall change our vile body, that they may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. We're going to be like Jesus. And 1 John 3, 2 adds, When we see Jesus, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. After that glorious rapture, the Bema seat is occurring in heaven. And he judges all of our lifetime of work, 2 Corinthians 5.10. And once we've been cleansed and purified and forgiven, we are made ready for the marriage to the Lamb, Revelation 19.7. Isn't that exciting? And all that's taken place in, for a seven-year period in heaven while the seven-year period of tribulation of Revelation chapter 6 to 18 is occurring on earth. Now, after the seven years, the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to the earth. And I got good news for you. Armageddon is not the end of the world, Revelation 16, 16. The nations are battling. We'll see that later. 
but he comes back to put a stop to those who are destroying one another and the earth, Revelation 11, 18. And from that time on, it's going to be a time of peace and blessing here on earth. They'll beat their swords and the plowshares and their spears in the pruning hooks, Isaiah 2, verse 4, and Micah 4, verse 3. That's why Isaiah 9, verse 7, quoted earlier, but bears repeating, says that when the government is on his shoulders, that's when he's here on terra firma, ruling for the thousand years, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Now, it is called the revelation of Christ because he reveals himself to the whole world. Revelation 1, 7, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. And now in a day of global television, that's not an impossibility. And that beautiful scene is described in Matthew 24, 27. And I may remind you that Jesus quoted all these texts. He said, as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 25, 31, He shall come in the glory of His Father with all His holy angels, and then He shall sit upon the throne of His glory in Jerusalem. Luke 1, 32. And then again in Luke 21, 27, it says, Then shall appear the Son of Man. Oh, it's coming, and He's coming soon. And what a day it's going to be. Not only that, but when He comes, you and I return with him. We were taken seven years before, and now we're returning, the actual second coming to earth. That's why Jude verse 14 states, and this is exciting, Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied of these things, saying, The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. The seventh generation after creation, they're already talking about Christ's return to the earth. That's how important it is, and some of you guys won't preach about it. <laughs> May God speak to your hearts. But he says he comes with ten thousands of his saints. In Bible days, they had no way of saying millions, billions, trillions, quadrillions, quintillions. So they just said tens of thousands and innumerable hosts. And I like what that great prophetical scholar, Dr. Walvoord, who's now with the Lord, said. He said, I think it'll be a 24 to 48 hour exodus out of heaven. Wave after wave after wave of the saints from all ages returning with the Lord Jesus. So rule and reign with him, Revelation 20, verse 4. I want to back up for just a moment. He referred to the fact that when the rapture happens and we go to heaven, we're going to receive glorified bodies. That's better than any makeover, believe me. The last time that I was visiting in a hospital, I saw some children in a wheelchair and I saw my own grandmother in my mind as I watched them because my grandmother was in a wheelchair just before she went home to be with the Lord. I saw children who were dying because of cancer. How wonderful to know that when we are in heaven, we're going to have glorified bodies. No more illness, no more cancer, no more missing limbs. I'll never forget singing in Chattanooga, Tennessee, looking at a little girl born uh, with a defect. Never get over it. Live that way all of her life. That's not going to happen in heaven. We're going to have glorified bodies, perfect bodies, and never to decay like the Lord, right? Amen. When we see Jesus, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, 1 John 3, 2. And he says, because of it, purify yourself with this thought. He's coming soon. Be ready to yeah, meet him. Yeah, so wonderful. Well, you know what? Way, way back, the rabbis and the church fathers from the very beginning went along with what Jack was just talking about, and they had what they called a six-day theory. I, I would like for him just to briefly give us that, if, if he would. A six-day theory, Jack. What is that? The rabbis of old, and I'm talking about Rabbi Akiba, Rabbi Bekai, Rabbi Jose, Rabbi Eliezer, many others taught that their Mashiach, and that's our Christ, would come after six days. And they said, a day is like 1,000 years, and 1,000 years is like a day, Psalm 90, verse 4. And because God created the world in six days, Genesis 1, 31, and rested on the seventh day, Genesis 2, 2, the world will go on for 6,000 years, and then on that seventh day, the final day, our Messiah will arrive. Now, we have 
already crossed into that seventh day on regular calendars, but the Jewish calendar still has another 10, 12 years because mathematically it's arranged differently. Now, it's a couple hundred years, but they found a 240-year heir, according to Eliezer Shulman in the Jerusalem Post, and that only leaves about another 10, 12 years before they say their Messiah will be here, and of course, that would be our Christ. We don't dicker about days because of the day and hour knows no man, Matthew 24, 36. But wait a minute, he goes back to verse 33 in context and says, I demand, that's the Greek, I demand that you know when it's near, even at the door. And you talked about his hand on the door. Oh, it's so near. But six days, 6,000 years. And the Christian fathers picked up on that. And they use 2 Peter 3, 8. A day is with the Lord like a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day. And they said the reason the Lord delays His coming is because He wants one more soul to be saved. Verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise to come again, but He's long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish. But, verse 10, the day of the Lord will come. When, Christian fathers? Verse 8, a day where the Lord is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. The world will go on for six days, six thousand years, and then our Messiah, our Jesus, will come on the seventh day. That could happen at any moment because the six thousand years are practically past, according even to the Jewish calendar. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Now, I want to show you something. We've got a lot of Protestant churches preaching Reformation theology, replacement theology. God is through with the Jew forever. Then God's lied 120 times. Get my book, Millennium, Beginning or End, to find out for yourself. All 120 texts are listed. But I have been shocked. This is one of the Roman Catholic priests. His name is Reverend Joseph Iannuzzi, and he wrote this book, The Splendor of Creation. And I'll tell you about the book in a moment from now, but let me read his letters first. Dear Dr. Jack Van Impey, please accept this book of my appreciation for all that you do to spread the Word of God. This book is acclaimed by two American bishops. I am a doctrinal alumnus from Rome, Italy, and enjoy your program very much. I hope this book assists you in the chronology of end time events. And here is a letter that's just arrived, May 16th. Dr. Van Epe, your evangelization is fantastic. I encourage you to continue to prophesy and prepare those who are open to the truth for the Lord's coming for a second Pentecost in Christ. Reverend Joseph Iannuzzi. Now, let me tell you about that book. Boy, was I excited. I would like to take this book and just make a full video on it because he quotes all of the great church fathers and proves that the Catholic Church has always believed that Christ would rule for a thousand years. That's better than these Protestant amillennialists who say there will never be a millennium. Christ will not rule here. The world ends. Now, what's the problem? In his book, he says that in the early days, there were some renegades who were preaching on the millennium as a matter of being a time of carnality, like the Mardi Gras, the carnivals, where there would be gluttony, boozing, alcoholism, and sex galore. And he said because of it, the Catholic Church was very upset and would not call it the millennium. So they call it, get this, thank you, Father, the thousand-year era of peace. But here is what's more exciting. You've heard me quote the great church fathers, St. Barnabas and St. Bartholomew, first century. And then in the second century, we had Arrhenius and Justin Martyr, all Catholic priests. And in the third century, Lactinius, Methodius, and then Tertullian, and he names them all and quotes them all and proves that they all believed in the thousand-year reign of Christ, the original teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. But he goes on to show that many of them taught the six-day theory that it would happen after 6,000 years. And I'll tell you, I'm blessed with that. And I pray to God that many will get their eyes opened. Many more of the priests, because Pope Benedict said, 
There is nothing in the magisterium that tells us what we have to teach about this rapture or the thousand years, so we leave it to the discretion of the individual priests. And that's why this man has put out this book, one of the great books in Catholicism, about Christ reigning on earth for 1,000 years. Hey, Jack, this priest, uh, he's in Italy, right? Yeah, he's a alumnus from the great seminary there in Rome. All right. Well, we go into every single country of the world with our program, and I hadn't seen that last letter. I appreciate it so very, very much. So it is such a blessing to be able to take the gospel around the world. That, that's one of the things that Jesus talked about, taking the gospel around the world, and we wanted to accomplish that and just recently did. So we thank God so very much for that. Now, I want to ask Jack another question. I got to say, praise the Lord. We are now in every nation on earth every week yeah, till every, Jesus comes. Every single week till the Lord comes. Well, uh, there was a pastor who lived across the street from us, and he didn't agree with Jack about the second coming. He believed in the time when Jesus would come and he would reign on earth, but he didn't believe in the rapture. He thought that when Jesus came to earth, that was it. You know, no rapture, and that the Christians would go through the tribulation. Well, he came running over to our home one day and he said, Oh, Jack, Jack, the coming of the Lord is so very, very near. He said, I can hardly wait for the coming of the Lord. And I'll never forget your reply to him, what you said, Jack. I have to laugh. I'm just inserting this here. I said, That's right, Herb. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm going seven years ahead of you. <laughs> and I said, Would you take care of my house and car while I'm gone? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know what? If you don't, uh, Jack, if they don't, a pastor or a priest doesn't exactly agree with you on every single little point doesn't mean they're not saved or that oh, they will no, be in heaven. Oh, no, he was my close friend, and I preached at his church many times. Oh, okay. And I almost got him straightened up before it was over. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to be dealing right now with the major prophecies that Jesus gave to us. And the first one will be false Christs and false prophets. We'll never forget Jim Jones. There he is. David Koresh. Won't forget him either. Matraya and Sun Mung Moon. My oh my, these are certainly men who proclaim themselves as gods, and people did follow them. Some of them died because of that. Jack, that's one of the signs that Jesus gave to us. There'll be false Christs and false prophets. Right? Oh, yes, Rex. Uh, let me back up for a moment first. Jesus was one of the greatest prophecy preachers in history. Some of you men refuse to preach a prophetical message. You say, well, I don't understand the book of Revelation. Don't you understand the four Gospels? Most of the signs we're going to give you here came from the lips of Jesus, or you had at least a part in almost every one of them. You see, it was Jesus who said in Luke 21, 11, great signs shall there be from heaven. And in Acts 2, 19, Jesus said, I will show wonders in the heaven and signs on the earth. And he was disturbed with those who wouldn't preach on the signs, the religious leaders of his day. And he said in Matthew 16, verses 2 and 3, I'm upset with you preachers, you leaders. Why? He said, you talk about the weather, and you can discern the face of the sky, but you are hypocrites. You cannot discern the signs of the times. And Jesus started out with that one in Matthew 24, verses 5, 11, and 24. And he said to be false Christ and false prophets, and this would lead to the Antichrist, who would be the greatest uh, blunder and liar in history. Antichrist shall come first, John 2, 18, and this false prophet with him in Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, which we'll discuss later. Yeah, we'll talk about that in just a couple yeah. of minutes. And then number two on my list, of the things that the Lord talked about is pestilences. And you know what? I'll tell you, we've never lived in a day and age like this. I'm going to deal, first of all, with AIDS and the origin of AIDS. Uh, take a look. Hunt for origin of HIV pandemic ends at chimpanzee colony in Cameroon. And, of course, there are 46 million right now that have HIV or AIDS cases worldwide. Oh, so sad. And India is home to most AIDS cases. And of course, it's gone in every country of the world. Avian flu, that's another one, potentially a major global threat. 
And that's another pestilence. U.S. scientists, bird flu could kill 50% of human population. Bird flu, a bigger challenge than AIDS, warns the World Health Organization. And North Korea trying to weaponize the bird flu. I cannot believe this. North Korea is not only dangerous because of the atom that they are, are um, right now trying to use, but they're trying to weaponize the bird flu. They're going to put it maybe in some kind of an aerosol can, and they can use it around the world anywhere they Giving want to. Giving it to all the terrorists, oh, yes. Oh, would be terrible, Jack. Would you say, Jesus, there shall be pestilences, plural, Matthew 24, 7, Luke 21, 11. And when we get to Revelation chapter 6, the rider on the fourth horse, a sickly looking pale type of horse, takes one fourth of the population of the world. How? Through the beasts of the field, plus the other things that are going on. Imagine they found this AIDS virus in the Cameroons through the green monkeys. And now the bird flu and almost every new disease, 25 of them, is through the beasts of the earth, the beasts of the field. Wow, what a day to be alive. North the prophecy is happening. Right, Jack. And if North Korea does weaponize that bird flu the way I just mentioned, they say that Al-Qaeda could use this and this could be one of the greatest threats that we have as far as terrorism is concerned. Well, can you imagine that way back when, over 2,000 years ago, the Bible spoke about atomic weapons, atomic proliferation. Well, let's just deal with two of the major threats right now. And uh, of course, that's Iran and North Korea. Many fear Iran would use nukes against the United States and Israel. The U.S. could wipe out Iran nuke program in just two days. That's a little comforting there. But Bush vows to protect Israel from Iran. Now, the group warns U.S.-Russia relations headed in the wrong direction, and we're sort of getting in that Cold War again because they're developing some weapons. North Korea threatens to wipe out U.S. forces in South Korea. Defiant North Korea fires missiles. We all know about that. And don't forget those other 27,000 nukes. And I want you to see where they are. We have a map for you right here. Worldwide nuclear programs now in the red. Those are all countries that are developing or have developed nuclear programs. And U.S. weighs new missiles shield. They say, we've got to do something to defend ourselves. This would go into Eastern Europe. And here's another one that would go into Japan, American Patriot missiles, to be placed on our bases right there. The one is in Europe to yes. help us defend the Middle East, right. and the other is in Japan against other nations in the Orient. Yes, yeah. Jack. So the Bible does talk about atomic proliferation, doesn't it, Jack? Yes. And again, Jesus preached about this in Matthew 24, 7, Mark 13, verse 8, and then, of course, in Luke 21, 9, when he talked about wars and rumors of wars. And you know what else Jesus talked about? He talked about atomic weaponry. How do I know that? Because Revelation 21, 16 states, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things, the 22 chapters of the book of Revelation, and in chapter 8, verse 7, a third part of the trees burns, and chapter 9, verse 18, by these three was a third part of men killed by the fire, smoke, and brimstone. So Christ was aware of these things, and of course, all the Bible speaks about this. Psalm 97, 3, Isaiah 66, 15, Ezekiel 20, 47, Joel 2, verses 3 and 31, Zephaniah 1, 18, Malachi 4, 1, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. And even though we have atomic proliferation, and now 36 nations either have the weapon or are in programs to make it, one of these days, these 27,000 nukes are going to be loosed around the world. But I am again telling you, the world will not end. The Lord's coming back to put a stop to it, Revelation 11:18, And there are going to be three billion at least standing there to meet him because they survived it all. When he comes and they see him face to face in Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. We'll be talking a little bit more about the comfort that the Lord can bring to all of us right now. And, well, we need that comfort, don't we, friends? We really, really do, because I've never seen anything like it. Unequaled natural disasters. I've never seen so many hurricanes and now tsunamis. 
uh, take a look at the 2004 Asian tsunami. I don't know how they got this picture. That is something. Well, 230,000 people died in 12 countries, and this family returned to Indonesia to find that all they had was wreckage, nothing left. And Hurricane Katrina, again, a great natural disaster. Let's go on to Hurricane Wilma. And forecasters see no respite in onslaught of hurricanes. Intense hurricane era may last for years. They could say that this could go on easily for the next 10 to 20 years. And so it is referred to in the Bible as some of the natural disasters that we would see just prior to the coming of the Lord. And we believe it's just prior to the coming of the Lord, Rexella, because in Luke 21, verse 24, Jesus speaking, He said, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Let me put that in modern English. He said, Jerusalem will always be controlled by Gentile powers, and it was for over 2,000 years. They did not have a nation, Israel. They did not control Jerusalem, but during uh, that glorious event on May 14, 1948, they became a nation. They raised the six-pointed star, David, and said, we call ourselves Israel. And then uh, and during that six-day war, June 5th through 10th, 1967, the Jews took Jerusalem. So it didn't happen for hundreds of years, a few thousand, but it happened in our lifetime. Now, why is that important? Because at that time when they controlled Jerusalem, he goes on to say, and here is a sign that will accompany it. The sea and the waves will be roaring. Oh, my. Tsunamis. There you are with the hurricanes and, and hurricanes. Tsunamis. Oh, yeah. yes. Another big one, earthquakes. We could name a multitude of earthquakes just recently, but the Pakistan earthquake has been described as the tsunami in the mountains. And you can certainly see why this quake, oh my, killed so very, very many lessons from the earthquake of uh, 1906. Let's back up in our own country, and this is San Francisco. That took place. Now, will it ever happen again? That's a big question. It's not a question of if, a question of when San Francisco could look back at the big quake and ahead to the inevitable next big one. You know, friends, that is a big, big sign. Earthquakes. Right? And Los Angeles, they're frightened oh. as to what may happen there soon, yes. the San Andreas Fault. Yes, absolutely. Now, that is a big, big sign, isn't it, Jack? Earthquakes worldwide. Definitely, Rexella. And again, who said it? Jesus. There shall be earthquakes in divers places. Matthew 24, 7, Mark 13, verse 8. Why don't you preachers preach what Jesus preached? You don't have to know the book of Revelation. Just preach these gospels. Oh, what more can I say? Not only did Jesus mention it, but more earthquakes are coming. Revelation 6, 12, Revelation 8, 5, Revelation 11, verses 13 and 19, and then the greatest earthquake in history, Revelation 16, verse 18, there was an earthquake. It was so great, greater than anything that's ever happened. But it is not L.A., it is not San Francisco, it is Jerusalem. And that's when Christ comes back, the armies of the world are there to try to obliterate Israel, to wipe her off the face of the map, and Yahweh God sends His Son to put a stop to it all. And his feet hit the Mount of Olives, and there's a shaking like the world has never known as the Mount of Olives splits down the center. And that is very near, as we're going to see from some of the articles. Well, you know what? It's long past time for us to forget about not being serious about asteroids. Could an asteroid really destroy the Earth? And should we be serious about a planetary uh, defense system out there? The Earth at risk, new calls for planetary defense from comets, yes, and asteroids. Scientists, asteroid has near collision with Earth. Now, friends, this just happened. And could it really, in, in astronomical terms, they call it a hair's breadth away. Could it really destroy most of the Earth? And they say, yes, 
very, very dangerous, Jack, out there. We say no, because the world's never going to end. Right. But Carl Sagan, uh, the great astronomer and scientist, now deceased, said there's going to be an asteroid that will hit the Earth. And it was going to block out the rays of the sun for at least 120 days, four months, and it'll be complete darkness here. He said it. Now, Revelation 6, verse 12, looks like he knew what he was talking about. I beheld when he opened the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Something darkened it, and many think that Revelation 6, 12 has to do with an asteroid. Jack, I had a little experiment going on, and I asked people, uh, many people, of all the things going on in the world right now, which one are you the most troubled with? Which one's on your mind the most? And usually their response was global terrorism. And I can understand why. Greater than ever risk of terrorists seen by the United States. Again, militant cells are rising in USA. Senators are told. Seven arrested in US terror plot. Now that was from Miami. And again, living on borrowed time, the threat of nuclear terrorism on American soil. Once again, Canadians charge 17 with terrorism plans. It's not just here, terrorism around the world. Today, the National Counterterrorism Center has a single all-source database of 325,000 names of persons worldwide who have known or suspected links to terrorism. Wow. Whoa. Only a matter of time before terrorists use weapons of mass destruction. This is something that should be on our minds. And Jack, uh, that's one of the last signs that Jesus gave to us saying, you will see terrorism worldwide just before I come again. In Genesis 6, verse 11, speaking about Noah's day, it says the whole world was filled with violence and terrorism. That's why God had to bring judgment call the flood. Now Jesus picked up on that in Matthew 24 verse 37 when he said, but as the days of Noah were violence and terrorism, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And it infiltrated the entire world, 2 Peter 2, 5 and 2 Peter 3 verse 6. It's coming. But praise God, I'm going to say it again, it's not the end of the world. There are going to be three billion standing there on that glorious morning when Jesus returns in Matthew 25. I'm going to put four signs together here, Jack. Murder, sex, drug addiction, and thievery. Now, you know, there is a great increase here in the United States in murder. It's hard to explain why and difficult to really understand why. The small towns are increasing as far as murder is concerned. The, the numbers there, murder rate in small cities jumps 13% here in the United States. Uh, something else troubles me. Murder now claims the lives of 50,000 Americans every year and another 10 million Americans are abusing drugs. Here we see it, the dawn of a new movement. On any given day, America locks down some 2.3 million people. Some 656,000 emerge coming out of those jails, and then two-thirds go back behind bars again. That's very, very hard to understand. And those small towns, that's hard for me to understand, Jack. They're kind of all together there, though. Linked together, aren't they? Murder, oh, yes. illicit sex, drugs, and thievery. Right. Uh, if you were to question these 2,300,000 convicts in the prisons, they're there because of one of those four sins. Right. And it's going to get worse during the tribulation hour when the 21 catastrophes fall in chapters 6 to 18. And Revelation 9 verse 21 says, even as the judgments are falling, they will not turn to God. They will not repent of their sins. And it then names them, neither repented they of their murders, their phodmachias, that's their drug addictions. Their fornications, that's their sexual immoralities. And their thefts. God wants them to repent. God wants to save them, but they refuse. Because 2 Timothy 3.13 says, Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving 
and being deceived. Jack, our scientists are trying to get together and see what we can do to survive the human race. And uh, someone that I deeply respect, probably one of the greatest physicists of the 20th century, humanly speaking, has come up with an idea, and that's Stephen Hawking, and you see him there. He says this, space key to human survival has to do with the colonization in space. In other words, he's saying, we've got to go out there and find somewhere else to live or we're not going to survive. Well, that's the human thinking. I do respect this man. I, and I do too. He's one of the greatest physicists in history. He's equal to Albert Einstein. And this man has spent years studying the black holes in space and he has studied the origin of the universe. And because he believes so much is going to happen here on Earth through these pestilences that we mentioned a while ago and the atomic weaponry and wars that he said, this whole world could blow up and we need to start putting colonies in space so that there's a place to go in the future. Well, I got good news and that's that the Lord Jesus, when he left, said, I go to prepare a place for you, John 14, 3. And you know what that place is? The holy city of Revelation 21 and 22, which will hang in space. It'll be 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, and 1,500 miles high. Someone has taken and enumerated the space, and we're talking about thousands of square feet for everyone who's ever lived on earth, and there would be room there for every human being. And it's gonna hang in the heavenlies as a space city for the first thousand years, and then it's going to situate itself on earth after the new heavens and new earth, after the purging takes place and the land is cleansed. I was talking to a minister, Jack, and he was saying, oh, you know, uh, he didn't believe in the millennium and so forth, but the, he said, all the signs have already happened. They've already taken place. And I said to him, well, okay, uh, when was the revived Roman Empire brought back into existence? He looked at me and said, I don't know. Well, that's one of the big signs yeah, right. that the revived Roman Empire will be brought back into existence under the guise and under the name of the European Union. Let's take a look at the cover of Midnight Call, the revived Roman Empire and the European Union. Well, here's the headquarters in Belgium. And you know, Jack, we stood in front of that building so very, very often, the European Parliament. Bilderberg lands in Ottawa. Now the security was tight in Ottawa where the rich and elite and powerful met to discuss what? the New World Order. My, oh my, that is powerful. And then Jack gave me something that I had never read before. It is Jeremy Rifkin's book, The European Dream. And this is what he had to say. These are tumultuous times. Much of the world is going dark, leaving many human beings without clear direction. The European Dream is a beacon of light in a troubled world. We used to say that the American dream is worthy dying for. The new European dream is worth living for. Wow. Whoa, that oh. is very powerful. Thank you, Jack. Yeah. I appreciate that so much. But the EU is prophesied in the Bible, isn't it? Oh, very definitely, Rexella. Revelation 17, 10 says there will only be seven world empires in history. Assyria, Egypt, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and revive Rome, the European Union. And we could take time to prove all of this, but I have scores of videos where I've already done this. But the amazing thing is that Nebuchadnezzar, the king in Daniel chapter two had a dream and couldn't remember what it was and threatened all of his magicians, astrologers, and soothsayers that if they couldn't tell him what his dream was, they'd be put to death. Nobody could do it. Finally, they said there's a Jewish lad that talks to Yahweh God five times a day. Maybe he can help. So this little Daniel stood in front of the great King Nebuchadnezzar and said, you're so fortunate. Daniel 2.28, the God of heaven has revealed his secrets unto you, King Nebuchadnezzar, as to what shall be when in the latter days. And in that dream, he says, this was what you saw in that image. And I'm not going to go into the details. He said, 
Assyria and Egypt are already passé. You are the head of that image, Babylon, but you're going to be overtaken by the Medes and the Persians, who'll be overtaken by the Greeks, who'll be overtaken by the Romans, and then there'll be a long lull in history. And at the end of the age of grace, there'll be ten toes wiggling, and they will be the ten toes of the European Union that begin to form this organization. Of course, that happened by 1981 when Greece became number 10, 1995, Austria became number 13, and now it's up to 25 or 28, and it's going to over 100, according to the president of France. And it's all here, ladies and gentlemen, and this European Union is going to have a leader called the Antichrist, 1 John 2:18, and he will devour the whole world in Daniel 7:23, and will have control over all kindreds, tongues, people, and nations in Revelation 13, verse 7. But it all started with the Illuminati a few hundred years ago, and Adam Wiesoft, whose goal was the creation of the new world order, the final world government. And the plan was that it would happen shortly at the end of 2000 or into early 2001. And up through this next 10, 20 years. It's arrived, ladies and gentlemen. Look in the back of your dollar bill. That was the insignia of the Illuminati. And it says, if you'll have it translated from the Latin, the birth of the New World Order. Mm. And there are organizations that started 50 years ago, like the Bilderbergs, the most secretive organization in the history of the world. I could name names of people you know who are in there. And they don't play around. You don't get anywhere near their meetings, and there are only 130 of them. And out of that Bilderberg organization, we have now also seen the rise of the Club of Rome, the Trilateral Commission, the Council of Foreign Relations, all of them promoting the new world order, the one world government. The prophecy is here. And I'll tell you, folks, Jesus is coming soon because we will be evacuated, raptured, snatched away in the twinkling of an eye before that final world power is in existence under the rulership of this Antichrist. But wait a minute, there's more. Along with that Antichrist, the political leader arises a religious leader who leaves the Christian faith and actually spreads the ministry of the Antichrist to control all humans. And that's found in Revelation 13, verse 11. I saw another beast rise up out of the earth who had the two horns of a lamb, but he spake as a dragon. The two horns of a lamb identify him with Christianity because Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, John 1, 29. But he speaks as a dragon, and that is satanic according to Revelation chapter 20, verse 2. So in the end time, there's going to be a man who comes out of religion, and we're going to have more to say about that later, Rexella. And he is going to turn people to this Antichrist, and he is the one that is going to create this mark of the beast. This number 666, which one must have to buy or sell. By the way, you don't have to worry about taking that number. It's not going to happen until after we're gone. In fact, it doesn't happen for the first 42 months of the tribulation period. It happens midway as this religious leader promotes this thing, along with setting up this image of the Antichrist in the temple, which is the abomination of desolation because it desolates and abominates the temple of God. And that's why it's used uh, by Jesus with that terminology in Matthew 24, 15 and Mark 13, verse 14. So there are two men, the Antichrist, the false prophet, the political leader, the religious leader, right? right? right. Worldwide, they can control people oh, like yeah. that. Well, you know what? I know the door through which the Antichrist is going to come. Remember the European Parliament building that you saw just a moment ago, Jack, and I stood in front of that, and the last time we were there, I got goose pimples. We stood right in front of the building, and I thought, he's coming through that door. That Antichrist is coming right through that door out of the European Union building. Whoo, that, that just really blessed me in a way to know that we're living in such a time just prior to the coming of the Lord. And I had to listen once again. Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled. Just trust me. I have everything in control. 
Well, there's a mark that everybody knows and associates with this political leader, that Antichrist, and it's 666. The end is nigh. Please call 666-6666. She couldn't get enough sixes there. <laughs> this is from the Globe and Mail. Everybody's talking about 666. ID chips injected into humans. A giant step into the future is about the size of a single grain of rice. And chip implants making waves for the future. Implant ID chips called Big Advance, Big Brother. Well, you know, the Antichrist has to have a way of keeping track of everybody on Earth. So the implants, that's a pretty logical way, isn't it, Jack? Yes, and they'll really use computers to keep track of all of those little implants within the hands and foreheads of people. All right, Jack, I have something here. James Canton in his book, Techno Futures, outlines the top computer trends for the 21st century. Computers will become powerful extensions of human beings designed to augment intelligence, learning, communications, and productivity. Computers will become intuitive. They will learn, recognize, and know what we want, who we are, and even what we desire. He goes on, computers will have digital senses, speech, sight, smell, and hearing, enabling them to communicate with humans and other machines. Can you believe where we are going as That's far as That's shocking, Rexella. And by the way, Stephen Hawking is the first one who said computers are alive. There's life in them. Whoa. And they're going to be doing these things. And now that's the second thing I've read about it. Now, that, of course, is Revelation 13, verses 16 to 18. And this is that false prophet who's pushing this in sponsorship with the Antichrist. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or forth, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it's a number of man, and his number is six hundred, three score and six. Six hundred we know. A score is twenty. Three score is sixty and six. There is that infamous number, six Six, six. You also can find it in Revelation 14, verses 9, 11, chapter 15, verse 2, chapter 16, verse 2, chapter 19, verse 20, and chapter 20, verse 4. Oh, friends, I could just go on and on naming so many, many more signs like a great Arab confederation and the awakening, spiritual awakening in Israel and so forth and so on. But I must get to something that is very, very important happening today. Russia is going to play a key role in the invasion of Israel during the seven-year tribulation. Where are we today? We're on the eve of World War III. Now, a lot of people say the tribulation uh, time will be World War III, Jack. You can elaborate on that in a moment. Russia is developing new generation of super missiles. That's why we are sort of in a cold war here. Russia expands naval presence in Syria. Russia contracts with Iran. See that closeness there? Russia dismisses U.S. call to stop cooperation with Iran. Russia and Chinese officials visit Iran for nuclear talks. Iran and China prepare major deal, and Israel plans to split Jerusalem. Now, there you see there's Russia and very, very close to the Arab world and very, very close to China, and they're going to invade Israel from the north. Oh, Jack, elaborate on that, will you please? Uh, the Jews in their writings, the Midrash Tehillim, say there'll be three invasions of Israel, and this really turned me on to this truth. And it's found in Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 to 45, when you have the kings of the north, south, east, and west, all congregating in the Middle East. And we find that an antichrist comes to the power in Daniel 9, 26, and makes a peace contract with the world in verse 27 for seven years. And all the world is excited about it. And we'll see that later in this video. But in the middle of the seven year period, Russia makes the first move as the first invasion, there'll be three, of the series called the Campaign of Armageddon. It is not just one battle. So they're at rest, they're at peace, and everyone's rejoicing. 
But Ezekiel 38, 11 has Gog, Magog, Bishak, Tubal, and Rosh, all cities identifiable in Russia now, Ezekiel 38, verses 1 and 2, saying, verse 11, I will go up against them that are at rest, that are at peace. That's Israel because of the contract that has been made through the politician that heads up the final world government, the European Union. So they move against Israel, but they don't succeed. They are pushed back in Joel chapter 2, verse 20 to Siberia, and as they're being pushed back, the prophet sees blood, fire, pillars of smoke, the exact effects of a nuclear blast. Besides, God, Yahweh God says in chapter 39, verse 6, I will rain fire against Gog of Magog, Russia. Now, the second move is when China comes, and that's Daniel 11, 44, as the north and east unite, and the leftover armies of Russia move in with China, and other kings, plural, of the Orient, could be North Korea, many others. For Revelation 16, 12 says, uh, the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, so that the way of the kings of the Orient, the kings of the east, the kings of the sun rising might be prepared as they move through the area of Iraq, uh, where the Euphrates River is, where troops are now stationed, and their way to Israel. And of course, what I didn't mention earlier is there'll be an Arab federation that unites with them. And in Daniel 1140, that's the king of the south headed up by Egypt. And then Syria, Isaiah 17, 1. And then we have Iran and Iraq under Persia in Ezekiel 38, 5. And along with them, we have Kush and Put, which happens to be uh, Casablanca, Morocco, Sudan, and all the rest of them. And then in Psalm 83, verses 5 to 7, we have the rest of the Arab Federation of Nations, Jordan, Lebanon, etc. Right now, 16 nations are backing Iran in this crude statement that they're making. Let us wipe Israel from off the face of the earth. Let's get rid of all these Jews. Do you know that's the last prophecy of this book? Psalm 83, 4, let us cast Israel off from being a nation that their name be no more in remembrance. And so here's the Russian army pushed back to Siberia. They come back with their ragtap troops united with China, they are defeated. And then finally, all nations come against Jerusalem, for and against, Zechariah 14, 2. But why? What was Armageddon all about, Revelation 16, 16? It happened, and you just saw that last headline, where they're going to split the land and split Jerusalem. It happens because they parted my that's on here at all is, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, we need to live daily for the Lord is coming is so near. Oh, yes, Jack. Sometimes we see these things happening, like the dividing of Jerusalem and the dividing of the land, and we wonder why all these things point to the coming of the Lord, our blessed hope, the rapture, the coming of Christ for all of His children. What a time to be living for Him. We need to be truly living for Christ every single day and not letting our heart be troubled by what's going on around us. When you received this teaching, you also received a gift that I gave to you, the book that Jack wrote about 1159. Oh, I trust that you will really read the book because it has given you so many more uh, signs and has more details that we couldn't really go into here today. it take too much time. But don't neglect that book. It is wonderful. So I trust that you will study it in depth, all the other signs that we couldn't give. And we're going to go on now. And Jack, you're going to tell us what's on part two. In the next part of this video, we're going to take all these expressions we mentioned earlier. Last day, last days, latter days, latter time, latter times, latter years, the end of the world, the end, the time of the end, etc., and prove that none of it, even what you've just heard, 
means that the world's ever going to end. It's not going to happen. Thank God that Jesus is coming back to set up a kingdom of peace on this earth. Oh, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Friends, we want to just add a word here at the end of part one of 1159, The Countdown. I trust that you've been enlightened, you've learned a lot from this video, and also blessed. Blessed to know that you have the opportunity now to go ahead and live for the Lord and to be His child in these days in which we're living, 1159, The Countdown. And look forward to 1159, The Countdown, part two, it will be out very, very shortly. But we have never offered a video or closed a program without giving you the opportunity to open your heart to the Lord. Maybe you have a real need in your life. We don't want to overlook that. Maybe you have something right now that you're calling on the Lord. I can't do this without you, Lord. We want to give you that opportunity. And I appreciate Jack so very, very much. We've never closed a program or a video without an invitation. And Jack, I know you want to do that. That's why we're in the ministry, in order to get people one to Jesus and ready for His return. And when He returns, you have just heard it, to set up His kingdom on earth, it's going to not only be for a thousand years, it's going to be forever and forever. Heaven of 2 Corinthians 12, 2 will be transferred to earth. Remember that prayer? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But the kingdom comes to earth. And it's going to happen so soon. And oh, right now in your heart, are you longing to be with the Lord, with loved ones on earth, heaven on earth, for eternity, forever and forever? There's only one way to get in, and that's through Jesus. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved, shall be ready. Romans 10, 13. So let's call on His name. Oh, Heavenly Father, Thank you for sending your Son, precious Jesus, God in human flesh, God dying for me on a cross from all my sin. I'm so grateful. Because of it, I today can be ready to live with Jesus Christ here on earth forever if I'll just receive him. Lord Jesus, you shed that precious blood at Calvary's cross for me. Oh, how you suffered for me. Oh, how you loved me. I want you, Jesus, as my Savior. Now pray it. Come into my heart today. Save me now and forever. In your holy name I pray this. Amen. Amen. Oh, isn't it wonderful to have the Lord in your life? I trust that if you made that prayer and asked Him to come in and you opened your heart and life to Him, you'll write me. And I will send you absolutely free this little booklet, First Steps in a New Direction. I have it in the mail as soon as I hear from you. So let us hear from you right away. You might even want to share this video with somebody else. I've often been asked the question, you know, Rexel, you always give a little saying at the end of the program, what is your favorite one? I think it has to be the best reason for doing right today is tomorrow. We need to be doing right today because of tomorrow. All right, we'll look forward to seeing you in just a short time and sharing not only our program as you tune in week after week, but we are preparing for you part two, 1159, The Countdown. God bless you. Until then, bye-bye.